Hey, this is James T. Kahn, and I just want to do a quick video talking about some exciting news. LibGDX uh, had the 1.12 release. I know a lot of people in Discord have been waiting for that, wondering and asking when is it going to happen, and so it's finally here earlier this month. What I'm going to do in this video is just talk about a few of the highlights, maybe show off a few of these uh, new features that we have access to with 1.12. And if you want to see the full uh, write-up, you can always go to this article and, and read through this in, in depth. It's up to you. But let's just go ahead and jump right in. So first off, we have this new audio switching API, um, primarily uh, available for the LWJGL3 backend. Uh, some nice features with this. The output device will, be get, will automatically be switched if the current one is disconnected. Uh, before on Windows, when the device was disconnected, you would just lose audio. So this is a definitely a welcome uh, enhancement. And we can take a quick look. What does this API look like? How does it work? There's a, a test on that. So if I go, I think I already have the, I already have the test runner running here in, in LibGDX. And I can just go to this audio change device test. I don't think you can hear it because I have it muted, but you're not missing anything. It's just a repeating sound. Um, but if I click on here, you can actually see uh, the select box contains the different audio devices that I can switch between. I have a lot because I have this recording software on here, my hardware interface, but I can switch to say my monitor audio. I can switch to my desktop. I'm on my headset right now. Um, but yeah, this so this is how you can actually switch. What you do is you get this. Um, let's actually take a look at the code and then we can kind of explain it. So if you come back to the test here, we'll just show you what's going on. We click, uh, this, this select box is getting created and we actually get this array back uh, from this new method, get available output devices. That's gonna return a list, uh, a string list of all of those um, hardware identifiers in string form. And then we have this auto functionality as well. Uh, the test goes ahead and plays this audio on a loop. And then you have a change listener on our select box whenever we change it. Uh, I guess, so I guess right now we can see we're switching it to null, which uh, that would set it to auto, uh, auto switch the device. Otherwise, if you select one of the others, then it just passes in that hardware string and you can switch the output device. So we've got this get available output devices, and then we've got these methods to switch the active output device. All right. Uh, so that is definitely a welcome change. That's good news. Uh, next, we have this uh, ha haptics API. And this is for iOS and Android. I don't use uh, iOS and Android too much, so I don't have a demonstration for this, but I think it's worth checking out if you do. So apparently we've got some new methods for adding in haptics. We also have the metal angle backend. So this is to combat the uh, Apple deprecating OpenGL on its devices. What uh, metal angle is supposed to do is translate OpenGL into metal calls so that you can still run uh, LibGDX, OpenGL applications on uh, iOS devices. And I don't have a iOS device to show. I have like an ancient MacBook that I don't even think can build the latest version anymore of LibGDX. But uh, if you have, if you do have a device and you're able to use this, I'm very curious to hear how it works. Drop a comment. Let me know if you're using it. Um, does it work well? Is it performant? I'm just, I just find this interesting. So drop a comment and let me know. Next, we have OpenGL ES 3.1, 3.2 support for LWGGL3. And uh, this is going to bring us, It's this kind of opens the door for other things like the possibility of adding compute shaders, and geometry, and tessellation shaders to LibGDX down the road. And the, the most exciting thing for me right now from these changes uh, is we get access to multi-sampling in the frame buffer. Uh, previously, we didn't have, if you had MSAA, if you had multi-sampling, uh, anti-aliasing on, and you use post-processing or something like that, you didn't, you can't benefit from it because it did not apply to frame buffers. So now with GL31, we can actually have multi-sampling in the frame buffer. And if you want to see how to do that, you can take a look at the at this test to, to see how it's being done. Um, but this is just kind of like the raw way, example of doing it to show you an example of the MSA on and what, 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 what you would have gotten before in your frame buffer because you couldn't have MSAA. So that's the most exciting change, but there are some other tests here. 
uh, the GL31 and 32. If you want to take a look at these, definitely go ahead. I encourage you to take a look. Next up, we have WebGL2. So now GWT back in supports WebGL2, which is uh, it's the last equivalent of e, uh, GLES 3.0. And that good news is now that means, you know, with that change, all of our backends are now supporting at least ES 3.0. Uh, so this is very exciting news. You can enable it on your GWT application configuration, use GL30. And I, so I worked on this one. Um, it's originally started, it was started by Intrigus a couple, several years ago, I think. And then I took over the PR and, and finished the implementation of it. And then, and that was last year and we got that merged. So I've actually used uh, WebGL2 on my last two jam games. That was before it got merged, but I was able to use them. Uh, using like a custom build of libgdx. And so let's take a look. What does that bring to the table for us? Here we go. So right now by default, uh, GL30 is not enabled. If you want to enable that when running the test, you can change, you can add this uh, parameter in and use GL30 equals true. If we hit enter now, we will have an open GLES3 context. And that enables the tests like um, Instance rendering test, for example. Instance rendering is very nice and it's very welcome to have on WebGL2. This test existed for a while. This isn't a new thing in LibGDX. It's just now we can run it on the browser. And to see a more kind of exciting example of instance rendering, uh, Ants Games has a demo available just recently, actually. And if we run that, we can see we're running in the browser. I got 60 frames per second. I'll hit space bar to get these cubes to rotate. And we have 25,000 cubes or almost 25,000 cubes rendering in the browser. I'm getting a smooth frame rate here. I dare you to try rendering, you know, 25,000 cubes without instance rendering in the browser and have it run smoothly. So the way instance rendering works in a very quick nutshell is you uh, previously without instance rendering, if you want to render say this cube or grass or trees, you have to render every single one separately. You could end up with a hundred. If you want to render a hundred trees, all the same tree, you've got a hundred draw calls. With instance rendering, you can render the same mesh many times um, with different transforms. As you can see here, they're all rotating independently of each other. Well, you can render that same mesh thousands of times and it's all within a single draw call. So that is a benefit here. And so even on GWT, we can get 60 frames. And where GWT is, you know, notoriously slow for 3D rendering in my experience, but we can get 60 frames if we use instance rendering. So this is very exciting. Another change or another feature that we get with the WebGL2 is multiple render target tests. So this is not a new test. This already existed in LibGDX, but again, we can now run it in a browser. And I'll just bring that test up real quick here. So the way that this works is uh, with multiple rendered targets or MRT for short, is that you can capture multiple textures in one render pass and then use those textures for different things. So before, um, actually, let me talk about what we're looking at. On the bottom left, we have the, the color of the scene. So that's our color rendering. We have the normals captured in a separate texture. This is our position texture. And then we have a depth texture. So we have four different textures here. And all of these textures are captured in one single render pass into the frame buffer. And this is handy because, for instance, um, on I, I'm actually already using this in, in the Mundus library where if you have shadow, if you have shadows, I had to do a separate render pass to get the this kind of depth texture that you see here. To get that depth information, I have to do a totally separate render pass of the scene so that I can get the depth information well now. I can actually get all of that in one single render pass. So it gives me, it's a little bit of an optimization for me because I don't have to render as many, I don't have to render the same scene as many times. And we can uh, see that there was a bunch of lights in that demo. So what, what this basically is, is if you've ever heard of deferred shading, deferred rendering, that's essentially what's being done in this test here. And uh, again, I won't go into too much detail, but just I'll just show you what it looks like when we build the frame buffer. We're actually attaching our three color attachments. So that's our diffuse and our normal, our position. 
And then we have this depth texture attachment. So in WebGL2, we were not able to use this before. And then later on, we can access that information by calling the frame buffer, get the texture attachments. And then we just call the index position of that, of that um, texture that you want to fuse, normal position depth. And this is just passing those textures into another shader to be used to calculate lighting and things like that. And so the benefit of doing this deferred rendering and uh, just a, also another term I'll throw out there, usually when you have these textures separated like that, you, if you ever heard the term G buffer, that's what this is. It's called a G buffer where you have the separate textures like that. Well, anyway, the one of the benefits of deferred shading is you can render a lot of light sources very performant because you are rendering, the, you're deferring the shading or the lighting until later on. First, you get all the information you need to calculate the lighting into a texture form. And then in a separate shader, you can do all of those lighting and shading calculations and it's a lot faster. You can do a lot more lights if you're just basing it off of these this texture data. So that's uh, MRT in a nutshell. And now we have access to this on WebGL2. Back to the article here. I won't go through all these other changes. I'm gonna, I don't wanna keep the video too long. Um, I would recommend if you to come to this article and check out, you know, for each platform, there are some breaking changes listed here that you may be important to you that you'll want to take a look at. And then at the very bottom, we have the full change log, a bunch of changes here. So feel free to come and take a look at these. Test out 1.12, drop a comment. Let me know how it's working for you. Are you excited about the features? Are you planning to use any of these features or... Yeah, it doesn't make a difference for you. Let me know. I'm curious to hear. And thanks for watching.